Good afternoon and evening, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar tonight on the Healthy Gut, Healthy Body with Dr. Melina Roberts. Dr. Roberts, she's a naturopath, and in addition is an avid lecturer, published author, and leading authority in European biological medicine. She employs a biological approach to identifying and removing stress from the body while testing and treating organs in a unique and very specific manner, allowing all the systems of the body to function optimally. An impaired intestinal system has a direct impact on the body's ability to regulate. Healing the gut with biological medicine approaches is essential in order to restore higher levels of health. In her practice, she incorporates the most innovative technology to treat chronic disease, women's health issues, hormonal balancing, pediatric health, cancer, and digestive disorders. Tonight, she's going to share her wisdom and experience on how to effectively heal the gut for optimal health. And so with that said, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Roberts. All right. Thank you very much, Heather. I'm so excited to be talking about the gut. Um, to me, this is one of my favorite topics because I think the gut is so central to our overall health. Um, I also want to thank you all for being here, um, taking the time out of your busy schedule to learn, to grow, to expand your knowledge base. I think this says a lot about you as a person, as a practitioner, because um, not many practitioners are making this kind of effort to expand their knowledge. So thank you. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself just briefly here. Um, I graduated from the University of Waterloo, I went to CCNM, um, then after I graduated I did some um, extra studying in European biological medicine at the Paracelsus Clinic with Dr. Thomas Rao. Um, I founded and uh, the clinic director now of Advanced Naturopathic Medical Center here in Calgary, and I've written a book called Building a Healthy Child. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we all have motivation behind why we do what we do. And um, mine kind of started with um, being a kid who had uh, really bad allergies and eczema. So um, I'm, I'm sure you guys have had those patients who've come into your practice and they're presenting with allergies and eczema. I was that kid. I, I was that kid that broke out in rashes to food, to things in the environment, anything that touched my skin, I was getting a rash. And it was this problem that I thought I'd just have to learn to live with. But my life changed when I was 13 years old. A family friend said to my parents, you know, you should try taking her to see a naturopathic doctor. We'd never heard of one before, but we we're willing to give it a try. And with some changes, my allergies and my eczema went away. It was like magic to me. I'd, I'd never understood, I never really understood it at the time, um, but now I understand that if you make changes, you can change that internal environment, set up an environment within the body that allows the body to be able to heal itself. Now we can fast forward many years of schooling, uh, going to university, going to the naturopathic college, discovering biological medicine, training with great mentors like Dr. Thomas Rao, um, many years of clinical practice, opening up my own clinic, writing a book. Now I'm here uh, with some gained knowledge and I'm honored to be able to share it with you. I want to teach you this. I want you to learn how you can change people's lives. I want you to get these kinds of results because I've never had eczema or rashes again. And I think, like, isn't that the kind of result that you want to have with your patients? So I want to talk about biological medicine and, like, how many of you are familiar with this term biological medicine? Because that term is something that I never actually really learned in school. I didn't learn until I graduated from the naturopathic college. Now, biological medicine really fits really well for, with being a naturopathic doctor because we, we believe in the body's ability to be able to heal itself. What the difference is is that we really talk about the body's internal environment. And if we can change up that internal environment, then we can allow the body to be able to heal itself. So I describe it as this twofold approach that first of all, we need to identify and remove stressors on the body, and then we need to work on improving the function of the organs. And if we could do those two things, then we can get
get the whole system to be able to function properly, function the way the body was designed to function. So that's the essence of biological medicine. Now, biological medicine really has two fundamental concepts. One is adaptability and the other one is terrain. Now, adaptability, um, this is really the way I define health. It's the body's ability to be able to adapt to stressors that come into the environment, um, and those stressors can be either internal or external. And every system of the body should be able to adapt to these stressors. And how well it's able to adapt to make those tiny changes is how healthy our body is. So the example is, is you know, if we put you in a hot place, like a desert, you're going to sweat. If we put you in a cold place, like, say, Antarctica, uh, you're going to get goosebumps. Well, uh, maybe you'll get goosebumps before you get frostbite. Um, but that's your body's ability to be able to self-regulate to changes in temperature. Uh, the other example of adaptability is when you have a fever. And as uncomfortable as fevers are, fevers are a healthy immune response to an invading pathogen. So that pathogen comes into the body and the body actually creates this environment that's not conducive for that infection to even live. So it effectively kills that infection. So fevers are a good thing and that's why we really shouldn't be, we shouldn't be suppressing fevers. So um, that can gets into a whole other debate, but um, that's the body's uh, um, self-regulation and adaptability uh, component. And the other component um, of biological medicine is this concept of terrain. Now, terrain um, is that um, extracellular make, matrix. It's all the spot uh, space that your cells are living in. Um, and in order for your cells to be healthy, they need this healthy environment to be living in and swimming in. And it's actually that extracellular matrix that controls or guides our body's self-regulating ability, which is, so this is really, our terrain is really key to biological medicine. So are any of you, any of you guys, a gardeners out there. Um, now, gardeners can really understand this concept because when you have a plant and that plant is sick, um, you don't actually do anything to that plant. What you need to do is you actually need to change the soil, change that environment that that plant is in, and if you change that environment, if you change the soil that that plant is in to a healthy, nutrient-dense soil, then that plant is able to regain its health. Now, that's the same with our cells. If we have sick cells, then what we do is we change the environment that those cells are in. We change the terrain and we can get healthier cells. So this is a huge concept. This is really the basis of biological medicine. Now, there's a bit of this debate going on between these two, um, these two uh, concepts, uh, or these two men who is um, Pasteur and Enderlein. And so there's Louis Pasteur and he's, um, He's really the founder of, in the sense, modern medicine, um, but he believed in this concept of monomorphism. So it's that a bacteria um, has just a constant one form life. It doesn't change throughout its, its life cycle. And it's really about infectious agents coming in from an external environment. And, and that's how we get sick, is an infection coming in from external. And so that's the, um, this is the concept that modern medicine is based on and the whole concept of antibiotics. And then there was this man, uh, this professor named um, Enderlein. And he talks about, he um, introduced the concept of pleomorphism. And so 
this concept is that microorganisms, they go through different stages of development and they evolve and they grow and they change in that single life cycle based on the environment that they are in. So in terms of infectious agents, infectious agents are coming from an internal environment. And this is the concept that um, all of the phantom remedies are based on, is this pleomorphism concept. Now, personally, um, I believe that um, both of these great scientists are correct. So I think that infectious agents can actually come from um, come from the external environment, and infectious agents can also come from that internal environment. And I think it is, I think, um, yes, we need to be aware that an infection be, can be coming from the external environment and try to figure out um, where that's coming from, and, um, and if necessary, then antibiotics can be needed. But we also really need to focus on the internal environment. And if we clean up that internal environment, then we can make um, a lot of changes in terms of how our system functions. So, and internal environment is a big concept in terms of um, biological medicine. So internal environment is what we call the internal milieu. It's that soil. So if we improve the soil, if we improve the health of the soil, we can improve the health of the plant or the organism. So our cells need a healthy environment to live in. Um, it's that internal environment that really dictates our health. It's all about the terrain, and this is really the heart of biological medicine, is this internal environment that we talk about. And What's really cool is um, is that there is a test, um, and it's a test that we run within our clinic called dark field microscopy. Dark field microscopy, and with this test, we can actually get a glimpse into the body's internal environment. So we can see what kind of environment our cells are living in. So whether cells are all clumped together, whether they're nicely spaced out, if there's inflammation, if there's oxidation happening in the body, how well we're taking in nutrients. Um, we also get to look at the white blood cells so we get an idea of what's going on with the body's immune system. So we get this r nice glimpse of what's going on internally in a person's body. We get that glimpse of that internal environment. And what that involves is it's a prick of the fingertip and we look at the live blood cells underneath the microscope. And so it gives us that glimpse into what's going on internally. Um, so I actually really love that dark field microscopy. I run that on uh, mostly every patient I see because I want to know what are we dealing with there. Now, um, these next few slides, um, I know that who I'm talking with right now is mostly healthcare prof professionals. And so these next few slides, I'm going to be talking about the digestive tract and digestion. And this might be review for a number of you, but I think it's also a really important reminder. So I talk about, you know, we're going to talk about the importance of the digestive tract. And there's four important concepts in terms of that digestive tract. Uh, one is absorption, and, you know, we'll have to talk about um, we are what we eat because everything we eat nurtures every cell in our body. So um, in terms of the importance of that digestive tract, absorption is a huge one because that's how we absorb those nutrients. So that's an important reason that we need to always be taking really good care of our digestive tract and how it corresponds to really every health condition in the body. The other important part of the digestive tract is elimination. So the digestive tract is also a way of moving toxic loads out. Now, if we're not effectively moving toxic loads out of our body, then our body actually will reabsorb those toxins. So it's really important that we're eliminating. And when I say eliminating, I'm talking about bowel movements, um, one of our favorite topics. So I'll go into more detail about bowel movements in a few slides. And um, the third important concept in, 
terms of digestive tract is that it's our barrier. So it's our barrier to the outside world. You can think of the skin as our barrier on the outside, and our digestive tract is our barrier on the inside. And it's really that first point of contact to the outside world. And we have chemical barriers and we have physical barriers. So those chemical barriers are the hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes, and then we also have physical barriers like that microbiome, that microflora that line the digestive tract, and then we have those mucous membranes. And those are the cells that line the digestive tract, and um, between those cells are these tight junctions. These tight junctions need to be intact because this is going to protect us. Um, you can think of these barriers sort of like as our protective mechanism. It's our army that uh, decides what comes in and what stays out. And that barrier needs to be really strong so that we're not letting anything into the body that shouldn't be there. And if those barriers are compromised in any way, it can really affect how that body, how our bodies function um, and how our digestive tracts function. And the fourth important aspect of the digestive tract is um, our immune system because sitting just inside of those mucous membranes, the, the lining of the digestive tract, are these immune cells called the Byers patch. And they're part of um, a, a bigger um, class of uh, tissues called the gut-associated lymphatic tissue, and it's called the GULT. And these cells, what they're doing is they, they're looking over anything that's coming in through those mucous membranes and, again, deciding what it needs to engulf, what it needs to eat, or what it will let into the body. So this is a huge part of the immune system. So you've got to realize that about 80% of that immune system is actually housed in the gut. So when we talk about building up the immune system, you've got to think about Heal, how you're going to heal the digestive tract. Now, how do we actually evaluate to know, um, first of all, that something's wrong with, or how the digestive tract is functioning? So, first of all, you got to think about what you're putting into the body. Um, what foods are you eating? And then you got to think about how do you feel when that food is going through any part of your digestive tract. So you've got to also be, realize that, you know, food can sometimes can take about 30 hours to go through the entire digestive tract. So, um, you know, people may experience problems, you know, um, a day after they ate, and it can be related to something they ate like 24 hours ago as opposed to what they just ate an hour ago. Um, so you've got to be really conscious that, that it can be at any point in that digestive tract. And the other thing that's really important is um, asking our patients about bowel movements. Because the bowel movements are going to give us a lot of information about how that digestive tract is functioning. Now, we also have to be aware of of the indications that are, are telling us that there's problems with the digestive tract. And um, I will often go over this with patients, you know, like if they're experiencing pain or discomfort or burning, that stuck sensation in their chest, um, then I'll explain to them that this is an indication that there's inflammation somewhere in your digestive tract. Or if they're experiencing gas, um, so that's gas from either end, right? So that's gas from burping or flatulence, if they're getting bloating. Um, this, any sort of gas tells us that they're not properly digesting the foods they're eating. And then the third indication is um, not ideal bowel movements. Um, and I will touch on, I think that's the next slide, on what, what is an ideal bowel movement. But um, if you have anything other than an ideal bowel movement, then so anything. It can be if you're not moving your bowels at least once a day, if there's undigested foods, diarrhea, 
constipation, watery stools, um, compacted stools, any of that is telling us if they, you have anything other than an ideal bowel movement, then that tells us that you have an imbalance in your gut flora. So often we need to actually talk about what an ideal bowel movement is. Because truthfully, I think most people don't really know what an ideal bowel movement is. Um, they know what's normal for them, but this doesn't always equate to ideal. So let's go through what an ideal bowel movement is. Uh, first of all, the color should be medium to light brown. It should be formed. It should stay together like a log or a snake. It should be smooth and uniform and a soft consistency. It should be about one to two inches in diameter. Uh, it should be quite long. It should be about 18 inches in length. So that's telling us that you're emptying out the whole colon. And you might not have that length in one bowel movement. It may take you three bowel movements, but basically in a day, you should empty that whole colon. And um, the end of the colon has a bit of an S shape to it, the sigmoid colon. So it should have that slight curve to it. And, um, you know, typically people who've, who watch Dr. Oz, they'll, they'll describe their um, stools as S-shaped, and, and you know that they've been watching Dr. Oz when they give you that description when you're asking about bowel movements. And um, it should have a mild odor to it, so, so it shouldn't be a really strong odor. It should sink slowly, and the way you'd know this is you've got to listen for it. So it shouldn't float. Um, that would tell us that there's actually too many fats, and um, and then it shouldn't really dive too quickly, and that's usually where you hear it um, coming really like the, when you move those bowels, and they just you'll it'll make a big splash and dive quickly. And in terms of bowel movements, um, you should have at least one to three bowel movements per day. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, uh, my normal is every other day, or my normal is every third day. That's what's normal for me. And my answer to that is that if you are eating every day, then you should be moving your bowels every day. So it's definitely a problem if you're not moving your bowels at least once a day. And these bowel movements, um, you should be able to move them easily, no straining, no pain. Um, you shouldn't have to sit for a long time and wait to have a bowel movement. And I'll, I'll hear this often um, from parents. They'll tell me how their child, um, you know, spends a half an hour in the washroom trying to move their bowels. And really, they should be able to go in, have a bowel movement, and then move out and get out of there. So we shouldn't actually be occupying the bathroom for long periods of time to move our bowels. That, that's actually not normal. And so that's important. It's important to know what an ideal bowel movement is. So if you have anything outside of an ideal bowel movement, then you know that there's issues with that gut flora, that, that there's imbalances in that gut flora. Now, there's so many conditions that are related to the digestive tract being out of balance. It's really central to every health issue that happens. Now, I'm a person uh, who has a, or unfortunately, has a really bad family history of heart disease and cancer. I don't know if any of you also have had life experiences that have shaped why you do what you do, but it's really from my life experience why I'm so passionate about treating and preventing chronic disease. So my mom had a stroke at age 54. Both my parents have actually passed away of cancer. My dad died at age 54. My mom died just last year at age 72. So I've lost both my parents. So it's because of my personal experience with chronic disease that I think about this a lot. I think, how can I ensure that I prevent these conditions from happening to me? 
I also think about how can I prevent these conditions to happening to my daughter, the, the next generation. What do I need to be doing differently? So I think about this a lot, and that's really why I think as I study everything, I realize that gut health is really central to treating all conditions. So, you know, we got this list here, and digestive disorders for sure, um, allergies and eczema, just understanding that a lot of the digestive, the, a lot of the immune system is actually housed in the gut and how balanced that microbiome is, that microflora in the gut, will actually dictate how that immune system functions. Skin conditions also related to the gut. Immune disorders, or remember all that stuff is related to the gut. Um, inflammatory conditions, it's, you know, if we're eating a lot of inflammatory foods, then we're gonna just increase inflammation in the body, and that's joint disorders too. Uh, chronic sinusitis, that's, you know, an infection that your body can't effectively fight off, immune system. Fatigue, you know, us just not effectively being able to break down the foods we're eating. Cardiovascular, I'll talk about that a little bit, but if we're eating really inflammatory foods, then we're making the blood really inflamed and um, hypercoagulated, which can contribute to cardiovascular problems. Um, metabolic and so conditions, and, and again, this can be related to gut um, malignancies. We see this in cancer, and, and you know, I, I see a lot of cancer in my practice. And, you know, one of my first steps that I work with patients is always we need to work on changing up the diet. We need to work on healing up the gut because it's so central to healing really every sort of um, pathology in the body and people are like oh but I'm coming in for cancer why are we working on the gut and you got to see how these things really are interrelated depression a huge one is that within the lining of the digestive tract the body actually um, makes about 80% of its serotonin so as we heal the digestive tract we can also work on um, depression and anxiety and any a lot of different um, mental health issues as well. So in terms of, um, so what I want to give you is I want to be giving you a, a framework of how you, you're going to approach um, healing the gut. And I'm, I'm not a strong believer in reinventing the wheel. You see, when I was in high school, I was student council president, and I got into this role, and there was really no handouts, no templates, no guidelines for me, no instructions. Now, seriously, I, I know I wasn't the first person to do this role. I was in a position where I had to start from nothing, and I really had to reinvent the wheel. So I made it my mission that year to create a binder, to create templates, instructions, guidance for the next person or the next people who had to take over this role in the future. So they weren't having to start from scratch. So that's what I'd like to do with you. I'd, I'd like to make it so that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I know a lot of people in our industry, they think they're not a big fan of this. They think it's like cookie cutter medicine. But I don't really see it that way. I think it, that in order for us to make progress in this world, we need to know what people did before us. Instead of reinventing it, then we build on it and we progress from there. This is how we make progress. Uh, we get to sit on the shoulders of those who did it before us, and then we get to move forward from there. So what I want to do is I want to give you a framework for helping to heal the digestive tract. So this is my approach. What I do is I work on, first of all, decreasing the inflammation. I call it the putting out the fire stage. Then we gotta work on healing the lining of the digestive tract. Then we gotta work on balancing the microflora, the microbiome of the digestive tract. Then we gotta make sure that the organs of de detoxification, that they're open and that they're moving effectively. And then our fifth step is that we need to reestablish, re-educate the immune system. Now, this first step is decreasing the inflammation. 
So when we have a lot of inflammation, we have this acidic terrain. Um, and when you look at the blood here, um, this is what we see underneath the microscope. When there's a lot of inflammation, what happens is that the cell membranes of, of our red blood cells, they actually, um, they become, uh, they kind of lose their charge, so they become stickier. And they first start to link together, then they stack on top of each other, and then they clump together. And when we see pictures like this, it makes it, you can see that when you have a ton of inflammation, it makes it really hard for these cells to be able to do their job properly. And so what we need to do is we first need to identify what's causing this inflammation. And usually it's multi-causal. Um, I, I describe it as, as that we have to identify it and that there's six stressors on the body. So these stressors are food intolerances, immune challenges, heavy metals, environmental toxins. This can be anything physical and anything emotional. So these are the stressors that you first of all need to identify and remove. And it, again, it's usually multi-causal. Now, what I do is I work on uh, changing up the diet. And so our first step is that we need to remove inflammatory foods. And, and this isn't a, something that you can just kind of partially do. You need to remove these major inflammatory foods in order to get proper healing. So I describe this as thinking of the gut as, think of it like a house. And that eating those inflammatory foods is like the fire that really will burn down the house. And in order for us to put the fire out, we have to remove those inflammatory foods. And if we just eat, you know, like a few of those foods on on occasion, then it's sort of like if um, you're throwing sparks onto a house that you're trying to rebuild. So what we really need to do is we need to make sure we remove these inflammatory foods. Um, so there might be more, but for sure, the wheat, the cow's dairy, and the refined sugar. The wheat, the problem with wheat is that um, over the last 100 years, they've done this thing called hybridization, and they've made it so it has this high percentage of gluten in it. We, as humans, can't effectively break down that, um, that high percentage of gluten, so it ends up causing inflammation in the gut. The problem with cow's dairy is that is that it has this protein in it called casein. And casein, what it is, is it's a large protein. It's designed for cow's digestive tract. And if any of you guys have seen cows, you know that these are large animals. So they have a lot larger proteins than us humans. So when we try to break down these cow's protein, it actually causes inflammation in our gut. And this can cause problems, right? And it's major inflammatory food. And sugar, the, the white refined sugar, um, it's like food for those unhealthy bacteria and fungus, and it leads to more and more of that overgrowth. So these are, so these are really important for helping to heal the gut. We need to remove those inflammatory foods. So we also need to limit fruits. I usually limit fruits to one to two servings per day, and I usually say first thing in the morning. And then you want to um, limit, um, I don't restrict animal proteins, but I say limit, you want to have cleaner pro animal proteins in small amounts. So wild or organic grass-fed and no pork. Now, we also want to work on alkalinizing that terrain. And some of the ways we can do that is we can do that with some alkala powder, and we can do that with basic tabs. And what that affects is that actually affects the extracellular space. Now, there's also these um, pretty great, awesome remedies called the Pleosanubis and Citro, And these are organic acids, and they actually help to remove pathogenic acids from the 
intracellular space. And sometimes that can be a big problem, is that we can't effectively move the acids um, from inside the cells. We talk a lot about the extracellular space and cleaning that up, but sometimes the acid is actually stuck intracellular. So these are great remedies to being able to change up that terrain as well. And the next step is working on healing up the um, healing up the lining of the digestive tract. So this is where we want to be able to um, we want to be able to give the body the raw material to start building and repairing. So we want to actually be able to improve the integrity of the digestive tract. So we're giving it the, the structural building box to help repair those mucous membranes. And this will help to repair, the, the NAG will help to actually repair the, um, those tight junctions. And the L-glutamine helps to heal the mucous membranes of the digestive tract. So it plays a key role in, in this. Um, and then, like, I don't know if you guys have any of those patients where you have taken them off of those inflammatory foods, but they're still not feeling better. And usually this is the missing step is that you, need, you can't just remove those inflammatory foods. You also have to repair the years of damage and really work on healing up the digestive tract. So sometimes this is the missing step, is the healing of the digestive tract. And um, I know this personally because um, I actually have celiac disease and um, just removing the, I, I realized that just removing the, the gluten um, wasn't enough for healing my gut, that I actually had to take it a step further and I had to work on really healing up the years of damage to my digestive tract. And, and you'll see this with your celiac patients as well, is that, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, I've removed gluten, I've been doing that for sometimes a year, but I still don't feel any better or still don't have great bowel movements or still have some issues. And it's because you've got to still do some other work. Sometimes it's healing up the digestive tract. Um, you've got to heal up the digestive tract. You've got to balance that microbiome. So you've got to do a bit more work than just removing those inflammatory foods, though that's extremely important. Now, the next thing we got to do um, to help heal up the gut is to balance that microflora in the digestive tract. And, you know, this microflora is a huge area of research, and um, it's, it's what I call, um, it, I find it so important because this is, this is our soil. This is building the soil so that we're able to grow that beautiful garden. And when I started doing research into this microflora, this is one of the reasons I wrote my book, because what I was learning was that if we have a really balanced gut um, and that microflora is balanced, diverse, then we can actually predict long-term health. So I... You know, I was realizing that with my chronic disease patients, this is what I needed to focus on. I needed to work on getting their digest, getting their microflora to be more diverse, to work on balancing it so we didn't have overgrowth of fungus or bacteria in that gut in order to get them healthy. But I was thinking, okay, well, when I had my daughter, I was wondering, okay, well, am I able to get this microflora in balance and diverse right from the beginning. What are the steps to do that? And that's what I developed is I developed a way of introducing foods in a way that properly builds up that gut flora right from day one. Um, so, and you know, it's of course it's easier to do it from day one, but it's also possible for us to do it um, after years of damage too. But what we'll learn about that microbiome is that it needs to be diverse, so you, which means that you have to have lots of different colonies of different bacteria. 
in the gut. And the challenge is, is that any time you're on antibiotics, antibiotics will kill off colonies of the good, healthy microflora. So it changes that biodiversity. And, and then you need that symbiotic balance of the, what we call the, the healthy bacteria and fungus, and they need to be in a nice balance. So some of the ways that we can do this, that we can actually obtain this um, balanced microflora, is that you can take a high quality probiotic. So probiotics are the good, healthy bacteria. So we want to reestablish that good bacterial terrain. And the other way that we can really balance this microflora, and um, and this is this is the work of Enderlion, because he realized that if we have the right environment, we have the healthy bacteria and the healthy um, fungus, and you have those at normal natural levels. But if there's the, I'm going to say, a, a more acidic environment or a more inflamed environment, then you get the overgrowth of these fungus and bacteria. And what these pleos do is that they help to down-regulate those overgrowths of fungus and down-regulate those overgrowths of bacteria to bring them down to normal natural levels. So these are very different than taking like an antifungal medication because an antifungal will be the same as an antibiotic. It'll kill off all of the good healthy, um, it'll kill off all the good healthy fungus as well as the pathological. And so these remedies here, like the Pleo Alb and the Pleo Beth, what they do is they downregulate the fungus to normal natural level. And the pleo not does the same with the bacterial overgrowth. So these are really key, um, key supplements for bringing that microflora, that microbiome into balance. Now, our fourth step in terms of getting this gut into better balance is making sure our organs of detoxification, so those organs of detoxification, which are the liver, the kidneys, the colon, the lymphatic system, that we get those working at their best. So we got to make sure that the body can effectively move toxins out. Now, if your body can't effectively move toxins out, it means that your body's actually reabsorbing that toxic load. And we also got to figure out what level we're working on in terms of that organ. So we could say, okay, the liver's out of balance, but um, are we going to work on the liver on a physical, nutritional level? Do we work on it on a biochemical, the botanical level, or are we working on it at a cellular level? Now, I talk about this in a lot more detail in uh, one of the talks I do with uh, Biomed on detoxification. Because the challenge is, is that if we have a lot of toxic loads in the extracellular space, that means that we can be taking all the right nutrients, but, to, but if we're taking all the right nutrients, they can't necessarily get into the cells to help support those detoxification pathways. So what... Um, these remedies do, um, these what we call drainage remedies help to do, it helps to move that toxic load out of the extracellular space. So then it's clean enough for us to now be able to do the support in terms of the biochemical support and the physical support. And so, you know, sometimes I know it, sometimes it kind of sounds a little complicated, but to tell you the truth, sometimes like it does end up being a lot easier than it sounds. Like I, I had a case the other day where I had a patient who came in with IBS, so had, you know, like a lot of bowel issues, had the alternating constipation, diarrhea, lots of um, cramping and pain um, and unpredictable bowel movements. And what I did with her is I just did, I did some probiotics, I did the pleobec to get the fungal picture under control, I did hepatica to help get the, her liver functioning better, then I removed the wheat, the cow's dairy, the sugar from the diet, and when I saw her a month later, uh, 
her symptoms had all improved, and she was having great bowel movements. She was feeling great. Um, it was a huge improvement, and really, that's all, that's all I did, right? So I know I'm talking about a lot of different things, but sometimes it can be just really simple, and this can, you know, it can make a huge difference in terms of how this digestive tract functions. Now, when we move on to the next step, so the next step is really important in terms of reestablishing the immune system. So trying to get the immune system, I'm going to say re-educate the immune system to now function properly. And, um, and Sanum or uh, Pleo Biomed has this great remedy called Pleo um, Ribosan. And what it's made up of, it's made up of this buyer's patch. So I talked about the buyer's patch in terms of, of uh, being part of the immune system in the digestive tract. And so it actually has some of that buyer's patch in this remedy. And what it helps do is it actually helps to stimulate those immune cells and it helps to re-educate that whole immune system to start functioning the way it was designed to function. We just start to introduce it, um, similar, similar to how we do it with um, any sort of glandular. Um, it's just uh, giving it um, some education in terms of um, what it needs to do, and then, and then allowing the body to be able to, to actually now follow through and do that. Now, uh, I think I have some t a little bit of time to go through a case. And so this was a case of a, a patient who came in to see me. She was a 36-year-old female. She had eczema. Um, she had had it on and off since childhood. Uh, she had had uh, flare-ups more frequently recently. She typically was just using a cortisone cream to keep it under control, but recently it actually hasn't been working. And she has bowel movements. Her bowel movements are actually irregular, so that to me is a very, very big red flag when she was moving them every two to three days. That tells me that her gut floor is off. That tells me that um, she's reabsorbing that toxic load. Um, she would have loose stools. Her energy was uh, kind of medium, so 7 out of 10, and sleep she had no issues with, she said. And so what I started her with was I started her with a probiotic. We did some basic tabs to just try to change up that terrain to just be um, more alkaline. The Pleo Beth helps to take care of that fungal overgrowth. Pleo Citro to just help move some of that pathological um, citric acid out of the cells. Um, the hepatica helps to get the liver functioning better, and then this is what I actually do with all my patients, which is I remove the wheat, the cow's dairy, the sugar, and getting them to make sure they're drinking filtered water. Filtered water is extremely important if they're having um, our tap water. Well, I'm not sure about everywhere else, but our tap water here in Alberta is uh, has chlorine in it. Chlorine will kill off all the good, healthy gut flora. So you got to make sure that they switch to a filtered, filtered water. And then, so this is the beginning of the case. And then what I did, that's what I did on the first visit there with this patient. Now, when they came back a month later, um, the spots were not as red. They had no new flare-ups. Bowel movements were now once a day, which is great, but they were still varied. They kind of varied between being formed and loose. But in my opinion, movement every day, um, if they're now being formed and loose, we're heading in the right direction in terms of bowel movements. So that, that to me is positive. So in this case, what I did was I did a probiotic. I did the pleosanibus. Um, I did some L-glutamine um, to help heal up the lining of the digest digestive tract. I did the uh, pleorebasan um, to help reestablish the immune system. I also did the lymphodrop with this patient, so tried to get the immune uh, the lymphatic system moving a lot better, and then continuing with the diet. Now the spots um, when I saw them, I guess month three or after. The, at the end of the second month, so month three, the spots were actually starting to heal up. Um, some actually had cleared up 
completely. She had no new flare-ups, and and now her bowel movements were um, where I wanted them. So once a day, and they were mostly formed, she told me. So now what I was doing was some probiotics. We were doing um, the pleorebusan. We did the pleobeth, did the NAG to help heal the lining and the tight junctions of the digestive tract. I did uh, the plat black currant bud to help um, improve the uh, the adrenals, and then continuing with the um, diet and the filtered water. Now, so that's just an example of a, a case I saw, which which I think um, you know had pretty good resolution in three months, um, and it's just really not really focused on the skin; it's focused on healing up the gut. Now, Biomed has this um, great kit, um, the Intestinal Rebuild Kit, and this was actually developed by uh, Dr. Thomas Rao, and he does um, he does a like a six-week, two-phase program that's really designed to restore the whole digestive tract, and um, it's similar to to what I'm teaching you here, but. Um, it, it takes a lot of the guesswork out. So instead of fig, trying to figure out what you need to do, then you just get them on this whole program um, uh, in terms of trying to figure out, okay, do I need to work on the fungal or the bacterial? Which system do I need to be working on? Because I do different testing within my clinic to figure those things out. Um, this takes all the guesswork out and just helps to get the system functioning better. Now, I think it's really important um, that when you do this intestinal rebuild kit with any of your patients, that you need to pair it with removing those major inflammatory foods. You need to remove the wheat, the cow's dairy, the refined sugar, or you're not going to get the optimal results. So I think it's really important that those are paired together. Um, I have another case. I think I have a few minutes left if Heather's okay with me going through another case and I can go through it a, a bit quicker. But um, what I have is um, I, I have a cancer case to present. Um, so I had a, a patient with, um, so coming in uh, 64 years old male, he was um, diagnosed with an incurable prostate uh, cancer. He had a PSA of close to 500 when it should be between 0 and 4.5. Um, and he had like nocturia, so peen in the night. And I ran some tests on him. And so when I looked at uh, his dark field, he had below normal white blood cells, which tells me that the immune system's lowered. He had some fibrin, which tells me that there's some liver congestion. Um, there was a lot of plasma particles, which is a sign that there's some leaky gut that we need to heal up the lining of the gut. And um, there's some bacterial forms, which tells me that there's an imbalance of the gut flora. We had some spreading platelets and phospholipid forms. This tells me these are signs that there's some fungal overgrowth in the system. Um, we also saw some mycoplasma forms, which usually tells me that there's some signs of degeneration. And we ran a heart rate variability, which told me that um, his central nervous system was really highly stressed. Um, sorry, his um, his sympathetic nervous system was highly stressed, so it was 100 when it should be around 60. Um, I did the regulation thermography, which is what we have in our clinic, and the thyroid was showing to be out under functioning, uh, which we see like quite commonly in cancer patients too. And this actually goes also along with the the low body temperature. When you have a low core temperature, that actually also sets up an environment that um, allows cancer cells to be able to grow or any sort of unhealthy cells to be able to grow, even that slight change in temperature. And um, we see the immune system is stressed, so, and that, that's pretty common as well in cancer patients as well, because you'll see that their immune system is, is depressed, um, that, that their defense mechanism is down. 
Um, we also see it also picked up on that there's a severe degree of um, enlargement of that prostate. So what I worked on was I was working on the overgrowth of fungus and um, sorry, sorry, so in-office testing, so the in-office testing that I do within the clinic was um, the overgrowth of fungus in a congested lymphatic system. So with my first protocol, what I was doing, I did probiotics, I did the pleo alb to help bring down those fungal overgrowths. I did the gulp fortifier to help heal up the lining of the digestive tract. I did the thyroid support, which should actually help to support the thyroid, but also increase the temperature of the body. I did Wobe enzymes, so helps to the protolytic enzymes. Um, you can use any protolytic enzymes, but it helps to break down inflammatory um, aspects in the body, including cancer cells. Um, I used Essiac to help build up the immune system. And then in terms of a diet, what I did was I do like uh, no grains, no potatoes, just because they turn to sugar so quickly. I removed the cow's dairy and the sugar, limited fruits, and use drink drinking the filtered water. And then within our clinic, we also do some other some other tests, uh, some other treatments. So I had him doing high dose vitamin IVs twice a week and some infrared saunas to help increase the body temperature and helped also another avenue to remove toxins. And so within one month, um, his energy was better. He had lost about 10 pounds on the new diet. He was going to the washroom. He was going pee in the night less frequently in his bowel movements. His bowel movements were, I believe those were a bit better than before. And um, my in-office testing just showed that he had some overgrowth of bacteria and some weakened adrenals. So in the next treatment plan, that's what I was addressing, was trying to get those adrenals to improve and then continuing on a number of the other therapies, uh, sorry, the other recommendations. And then I also added in the local hypothermia three times a week. Now, two months after his follow-up, uh, his PSA was retested, and so it had come down from 500 to 100. Um, so it's still quite high, but, um, but it is moving in the right direction, right? So his energy was good weight was stable, his bowel movements were good, and what I was picking up on in terms of the in-office testing was the weak kidneys. So that's what I was just focusing on. So I did that with Solidago to help boost up his kidney function. Um, the other thing that I was started this month, uh, this treatment plan doing was the Pleolat suppositories. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Pleolat, but um, what it helps to do is actually helps to break down the lactic acid layer that is actually formed around cancer cells. And it's a protective mechanism around cancer cells to make it difficult for the body to be able to effectively break down cancer cells. So the pleolat actually helps to break down that pathological lactic acid around the cancer cells. And because we're able to access the prostate rectally, we can actually get this remedy right into, um, or it can be basically right beside that prostate and effectively um, help to break down that lactic acid layer so that we can actually start breaking down those cancer cells. So I think that that's, that one's really important and effective. Now, three months later, um, he had gained back about four pounds. Not not too notable there. Um, he was feeling good overall. Now we're still seeing some overgrowth of fungus and some weakness in the kidneys. And again, what I did was I used the Solidago to help boost up the kidney function. A lot of this is all the same. And then um, at the four-month mark, again, he went and got his PSA checked. His PSA was then down to 30.4. Um, so still high but moving in the right direction and and here I was noticing that we we're getting some lymphatic congestion and so what I added in with this month's treatment was I added in the lymph drop to help just decrease the um, sorry help to get the lymphatic system moving and I think it's really just um, when we talk about the lymphatic system in cancer this is a whole other topic but um, I'll touch on it a bit because I think that oncologists are 
they they talk about not touching the lymphatic system, that if you move the lymphatic system, then you could be spreading the cancer around the body. But what you need to understand is that the lymphatic system is this dynamic system and that needs to be constantly moving. And, and if it's stagnant, then that's when problems can arise. So we actually want this lymphatic system to be moving, cleaning up tissues, moving that toxic load out. So we do want the lymphatic system to be moving in cancer in in people with cancer, but they need to actually be able to effectively move that toxic load out. So the lymphatic system actually dumps into the liver, empties out the colon. So you actually don't want to be moving that lymphatic system till you know the liver is functioning well and that the bowels are moving. And so at the seven month mark, that's when the PSA was checked again and it was around 10. This patient's actually doing really well. He's he's still doing well today. He's back at work. He's living a, a normal, vital life. So uh, thank you so much for listening to me. I know I went a little bit over time. Um, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this, this webinar and that you got some valuable information from it. Um, we are Here's my website up here. Um, I'm really active on Facebook, so you can follow me on there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to um, send any questions or comments to my email address, which is right there. And, and then I'd like to thank Biomed for inviting me to speak. It's always a pleasure. So thanks so much. I'll pass this over to Heather. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And... Um... So thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for sharing uh, your wisdom, um, not only just healing the gut, but why healing the gut is so important for um, optimal health in general. And uh, with that said, there's a whole bunch of questions. And so um, if you're ready, I'm going to start with some of them. Okay. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Okay. I just have to filter through here. And the first question is... Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, are you doing any stool testing prior to treatment with patients? Um, typically, typically I'm I'm actually I'm not doing stool testing. Um, so if they if they're say if they're having um, say blood in their stools, then I will send them to their GP to to get a stool sample to make sure that there's no bleeding. But in general, um, yeah, in my protocols, I'm not actually um, checking um, checking stool samples or, or doing any of that intensive testing. You know, I think it would all only do it if, if things weren't, um, if things weren't progressing, if we weren't seeing, we we're doing all this work and their bowel movements weren't, um, coming to balance, then it would want to do some, explore things a little bit further. And um, just as a side to that question, do you find that some of the other tools that you're using, like dark field, can also give you clues that maybe a stool test would be giving? Uh, yeah, I think so, because I think with the dark field, I'm able to see the imbalances. Um, I can't see, I don't pick up, I can see that there's, um, evidence of fungal overgrowth, that there's evidence of bacterial overgrowth. So that helps me to kind of direct my therapies um, towards that. Um, but I know the stool, some of the stool testing can be quite exact, but you know, like even getting those, that information doesn't necessarily change my treatment plan. Because I, if I see that there's a, it's still a fungal, but now we have the name of the fungus that's overgrown, I'd still use similar remedies in terms of the treatment. Sounds good. Well, biological medicine in phantom often is the bigger umbrella approach. And when you treat the terrain, you're not always going after specific things, but rather getting things balanced again. Yes, for sure. Okay, so next question. Uh, when you say sugar, do you mean white sugar or also dates, coconut sugar, dried fruit? So when I say sugar, I mean white refined sugar. Um, I'm I'm okay with patients consuming natural sugars um, like um, so uh, coconut palm sugar is okay, real maple syrup, raw honey, stevia, 
Um, dates would be fine as well. That would fall under um, natural sugars. The challenge is, is that you also got to be careful with things that you, you think are natural sugars. It's labeled that way, but when it's actually checked, it still is acts like a white refined sugar. For example, um, you know, on the shelves there's um, cane sugar, and and they're finding that the cane sugar still has that same glycemic index as white refined sugar. Uh, that's the same with agave sugar has still is really processed, so still ends up being like white refined sugar. And they're even finding that with the, the sugars um, on the shelves that are like raw, even if it says raw organic sugar and it looks like little rocks, um, it still seems to be quite refined. So I still stay stick with um, uh, maple, real maple sh syrup or raw honey. All right. Um, so the next question. Um, is a naturopath who's seeing more mamas with babies reacting to food that the mom eats through breast milk. So how does this fit into German biological medicine? Um, so I always say that we have to change mom's diet in order to heal baby. Um, so we need to remove those um, trigger foods. Um, we got to clean up mum's diet, take out those inflammatory foods out of mum's diet. I assume we're talking about a breastfed baby and babies reacting. Am I correct? Yes. In from the that, question. Okay. From that question. Um, yep. I, so um, yeah. So what I yeah I recommend doing is that mum needs to change her diet. She needs to remove the offending foods, uh, remove inflammatory foods. We need to get mum onto a good probiotic, and and this will typically translate to um, to a baby actually uh, doing a lot better on the breast milk. Perfect. Uh, okay, uh, so next question. Uh, what are you using for thyroid support? And um, I'm going to assume this was part of one of the, the comments you were talking about within the presentation. Um, I Sorry. use a remedy that I get made up, but it's actually very similar to the remedy that Biomed has. So I'm going to let Heather tell you about their um, that Biomed's thyroid support because I think that mm -hmm. that one would work very well. Yeah, for it works very well. For thyroid, for thyroid support. So I'll let you yeah. talk about that. <laughs> sure. Okay, sounds good. Restorative thyroid support. So we've got a product called BioSci, and um, oh, yeah, that's it. it has consistently over the last 15 years been one of the best um, selling products we have, and that's because it is such an effective product. Um, it's a thyroid support a lot of the time for low thyroid function. It contains L-tyrosine, uh, iodine, selenium, zinc, and then it also has an ingredient in there called uh, protein hydrolysate, um, or hydrolysate, which um, does potentially have some organotherapy effect uh, with the thyroid as well. While this doesn't contain thyroid glandulars, because in Canada, um, no natural health products are permitted to contain glandulars. Um, this product does have a beneficial thyroid organotherapy-like effect in the body. And so, um, yeah, practitioners and patients find that it's a very effective thyroid formula. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. Um, okay, uh, so uh, great information. Thank you. Just wondering how you assessed congestion stagnation at each visit for the prostate cancer patient. And then she said dark field microscopy and with a question. Um, so so I just had, I use different tools within my practice. Um, some One of the ones that we're picking up that prostate, but I don't do it at every visit, but how I initially assess that prostate um, issues would be um, with the uh, yeah, yes, the dark field microscopy would give me an insight into that internal environment and whether there's congestion going on in the system, and um, the and then the um, hyper uh, the thermography gives me an idea of um, where the regulation issues are, 
and then I also just do a I do another therapy where um, I'm just assessing in terms of um, I actually use muscle testing in my clinic, and I just um, go over the different organs and just figure out where um, which organs are out of balance and which ones I need to be focusing on. So I use that, and I also do some electrodermal screening. So just some different ways of um, I say talking in a language that the body understands. So using the the nervous system in order to figure out where those imbalances are in the body. So that's what I do with each visit. And then I usually do the other testing with a cancer patient every three months. All right. Um, okay, so now we've got, um, oh, she says, perfect, thanks. Um, okay, so a question about your steps. Um, Christina had missed the second step of the protocol um, with the first decreasing inflammation, so she was just wondering what the second step um, oh, is. Uh, so the second step is that you want to heal the lining of the digestive tract. So I might have gone over it pretty quickly, <laughs> but okay. yeah, you want to heal the lining of the digestive tract. You want to give the body the building blocks in order to be able to repair and um what I use is I use the um, the NAG, the NAG, and L-glutamine to help give the body the building blocks to help repair. All right. And um, we have just a couple more here. Um, and so the next question is, should you always begin with strengthening and optimizing <clears throat> the function of the liver and kidneys before treating the lymphatics? Um, so that's yes. Uh, because in terms of the flow, it's, and it's really about understanding the flow patterns of the lymphatic system. So you have your uh, superficial lymphatic system, which drains the head, the neck, the skin, the breast. And then you have your deep lymphatic system, which drains all your deep vital organs. So um, the, the superficial lymphatic system, you can think of it like a funnel. So the superficial lymphatic system drains into that deep lymphatic system. It all filters through the liver, and then it empties out the colon. So you got to make sure that the colon is moving. Then you got to make sure that the liver and kidneys work really closely together. you got to make sure that the liver and the kidneys are working well, and then you start working on the lymphatic system to make sure that um, – that you're not just activating that lymphatic system, but then it has nowhere to drain. Hopefully that makes sense. It does make sense. And uh, for more information, uh, there is, um, Dr. Roberts did do a talk on detoxification. And so in that webinar, which we do have in our archives, um, she goes into this in detail and talks about that and kind of this system. So if you want more information about that, then we um, have it recorded. Uh, and I can share that with you. So I think that that is the end of the questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight on our webinar on Healthy Gut, Healthy Body, the Healing the Gut from a Biological Medicine Approach. And Dr. Roberts, thank you so much for um, speaking with everybody tonight and um, sharing your wisdom and experience on how to effectively heal the gut for optimal health. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate everyone being here, too. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yes, it's true. Uh, I mean, this webinar works when people are here listening. And so thank you for sharing and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. That was uh, really awesome. And have a good evening.